Difficulty breathing. <laughs> Not from coronavirus, but lack of fresh air. Locked in a cell, 24-7. The pair of us. It's the size of your bathroom. One on the other, on top of each other. It's the stench. The sweaty smell of our unwashed bodies, seven days running. Locked up in the matchbox room. In and out we breathe, we inhale and exhale over and over again. The same recycled air, almost suffocating. <sighs> and yet not. All right, I'm Gary, Gary Lee. That was written by Simon. I started to write in a prison cell and I continued to write during COVID. Lots of us did. And now our stories are in this book. This one's mine. Most of my youth and part of my adult life locked the fuck down. After two or three times, it's like riding a bike, except I'm riding lockdown, HMP, styly. Once I get my head around it, it's like a piece of cake. 8 a.m., key rattles in the door. Screw shouts, breakfast. Back in cell, tobacco, food, tea, nice, easy. 9.30, keys in the door. Want to go education, Lee? I tell him, turn it in, gov. Shut the door, please, I'm sick. I need my meds, I just want to be alone. I'm now free to watch daytime TV, smoke, read, wait until lunch. Anyway, you get the picture. Piece of cake, right? You don't have to deal with no one, worry about bills or anything other than getting a line of smack or a joint. That was then. Then it started. COVID-19, 2020. Lock the fuck down. 6.30 a.m., Mrs. stirs for work. I'm awake. Morning, love, I say. I go and relieve myself, get back under the quilt. My phone vibrates. How many brain-numbing conversations on the phone am I expected to have? I pick it up and I check the book face. Friends doing perfect stuff. Oh, look, there's some homeschooling going on with that most dysfunctional family. I can see my daughter called again last night. On this occasion, I don't feel guilty. I didn't miss her calls on purpose. Gary, coffee's ready if you want it, my missus shouts. I'm genuinely happy for a hot moment. Thank you, darling, I say. I wonder, is that going to be my moment? Out of 440 minutes of the next 24 hours, is that it? The missus says, bye, I'm off, I'm going to be late. See you, love, drive carefully, I say. I watch BBC 24 on loop for two hours. We're fucked, I mumble. I then admonish myself for watching the news. Then I admonish myself for admonishing myself. There's the phone again. The pre-selected ringtone tells me it's my daughter, Danielle. I love Danielle. I can't bring myself to answer. What would I ask her? Hi, babe, you okay? The kid's okay? I tell myself, of course they're okay. They're always okay every time I ask. It's a pointless throwaway remark. Just like... Drive carefully. I could have chatted to my grandkids on FaceTime. I love my grandkids. The phone stops ringing with an accusing silence and the day stretches out before me. Nothing to do and nowhere to go. Anyway, you get the picture. I know what lockdown I bloody prefer. That's what I wrote. Today, you're going to hear what some other people have written. Lockdown was difficult for everyone. I mean, my business went under, and at times, I felt like I wanted to be in here with you lot. Nothing to worry about. Mind you, I, I don't think it's been too good for you guys either. I've got an idea, but I didn't do my bird during lockdown. There are two guys, David and Alan, who set this programme up. They wanted to make sure that when the history of the Rona was written, it would include everyone's voices. 
especially the people like us who are often ignored, people of experience of prison, homelessness and addiction. Look at me, I learnt to read in a prison cell and now I'm doing stuff like this. It's called paper chains. That's why we're here. People like you, people like me, we've got our stories in the cover of this book. And let's face it, we're not often listened to, are we? But we're all actors and writers in a way. We've all got a story to tell. That's what we're doing here. Telling our stories, one person at a time, one nick at a time. This was done by Jimmy. I was in HMP Portland when I first saw it. I heard the reporters' warnings and saw the Channel 4 stories. I tried to ignore it. They called it COVID. See, in the beginning, before most stores are closed, it started when they forced the boats to port off coast. The ports were closed, and I was left with a sinking feeling of raw emotion for a moment, followed by a thought-provoking, awkward notion at times. Times were changing. And when they started mentioning lockdowns and isolation, I was left with icy veins. My mind would race night and day as I would try to contain my dismay, but my head was shot to bits. Because I couldn't stop watching bits of politics and that Boris prick with his blondish wig and what's of this apocalyptic zombie shit? It's nonsense, kids. It does not exist. And on the wing, everyone is gossiping. They've all become philosophers and science freaks on this Chinese shite disease. Meanwhile, I just need my release and some quiet peace. And on the day that I actually left the gate, I couldn't help but hesitate because straight away I was shown the signs of coronavirus. The roads were quiet, lonely, silent. And in the air, there was a strong scent of pine disinfectant wipes. I guess it might just reflect the times, but... What affects my mind is there's a lockdown in effect tonight so I'm left to try and use my disconnected mind to connect some lines and make collective lines about the messy life that I have left behind. So I guess if I've got a message guys it's... Stop looking for that greener grass, just keep on planting seeds then calmly water and feed your pastures then reap the harvest and if you need to ask for help don't be disheartened please just ask now you can't delete the past or its weeping scars just don't keep the plasters and repeat disasters leave the darkness see right past it never retreat advance to achieve your targets just reach for stars and keep on marching We're all prisoners in a way. I mean, you can be as free as you want, but if you ain't got no time, you've got no freedom. We spend most of our time in our nuts anyway. What is freedom? For Steve, it's mushy peas. Day one, fear. Being held in isolation against my will. Basically like every other day. Panic set in after three hours. No food, no drink. Then I remembered I had a tap and a flapjack. Woo. But as I was eating it, emergency, a crumb slid down into my dressing gown. I was naked underneath to preserve precious clothes supply and it settled somewhere only lovers should see. Don't judge me, but I still ate it. In times of trouble, are we not all capable of savage acts of barbarism? I imagine support marches across the UK have started. They do worry about us. Just been told enforced exercise is at 2.15. This punishment just gets worse. Day four. No end in sight. The mind games have started. 
The enforced exercise was an hour earlier today. They don't realise that I know. That I can measure time. I placed one kidney bean. Didn't work with baked beans. On top of another until they reach the ceiling and that is one hour. They have painted lines on the ground outside, clearly measuring our walking speed and to listen in to our plans. I've heard rumours the vegetables are clumps of sand, painted bright colours. I was granted a brief audience with head honcho Pika today. He tried to recruit me to write propaganda for his Pikas. Said he would love to read it and sign it. Always one step ahead. They just want to know my thoughts. Day 30. Wednesday, I believe. I am writing this on Thursday, but as it is entitled Wednesday, that means I can be prophetic and positive and announce that tomorrow does indeed exist. Hurrah! I seem to be writing in the style of a poor lowly gesture of the 18th century. Have I lost my mind? Whispered conversations heard outside my steel barricade. Fortunately, my unicorn melons helps me remain grounded and calm. Day 42. Monday mayhem. This is madness. I don't know how they do it, but the Peekers have managed to remove the May Day bank holiday from the calendar. This must be a sign of their ever-increasing power. Melons is sulking. Enforced exercise was early today. I rode around on melons for half an hour. No one noticed. She still wants a humbug. Day 47. Time has ceased. I am starting to talk to penguins. I don't know how they cope with the heat. Melons tells me I am imagining them, but what does she know? She might be gorgeous, but she is not the brightest. A rumour is going around that a peeker is missing. We'll investigate. Day 60. No way, day 60. Ah! I made it. Battled away to 60. Not my age. I might not make that. But the amount of days various peekers have used in genius ways to destroy me. Each sweep of my comb reminds me of passing time as each silvery thread flutters and falls to the floor like an anorexic snowflake. They went too far today. Mushy Pea Friday was stolen from us. They replaced our mushy peas with something so evil I can hardly bear to bring myself to write it. They replaced my beloved mushy peas with... <laughs> Please! Can you believe it? The fiendish foes! Stone together, that's what they say in it. I mean, I weren't too bad off. I didn't have a super yacht to bash my way through the waves, but I did have a paddle boat. Sometimes I felt really alone. So did another Gary who wrote this poem. I'm looking for some volunteers to help me read it. Oh, thank you. So they're numbered pieces. If I put my one finger up in the air, you read number one. If I put two fingers up, don't take offence, it's just so you can read number two. Got number three over here for you, sir. Thank you very much. And number four there for you, madam. Thank you very much. If you, if you wouldn't mind keeping your voices up so that everyone can hear you. We're all in this storm together. The unconnected and the uncultured. There are three lessons for the uneducated. 
You can't clean hospital toilets from home. You can't keep two metres apart on public transport. We are all in this together. We're separate, but not separated. We're in isolation, but we're not alone. The four people working back to back shifts, looking after those that have become surplus to requirements. For you, we will clap. And now that most of the shops are closed, your minimum, minimum wage should be last longer. See, there's good news. The government turned the closed down hotels into prisons for the homeless and set up a task force to look into the reason that people in ethnic communities are dying in much higher numbers than the rest of us. We're all in this together. The big cover-up. The use of face masks could be made compulsory. You can now hide your big chest chagrin as you push your overloaded trolley past your elderly neighbours. As they walk bent double in overcoat and gardening gloves, searching for their milk and porridge. We are all in this together. We've started to say hello to one another, but more in a way as warning than a friend. Keep two metres apart. Thanks, guys. Really well written. Thank you. Bloody marvellous. The anger. I'm sure we've all felt it at times. Ryan turned ease into a play. Roll has gone absolutely everywhere. I'm telling you, I'm just trying to open the papers. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have an extraordinary story unfolding here in front of our very eyes. You join us outside HMP Blackstock, a place where we believe that three inmates have taken on the task of running the prison themselves. The stay at home message did not apply to prison staff, but those who actually run this joint are taking no risks. It's truly extraordinary. I've been journalist John and we'll keep you updated as we can on this current revelation. What on earth are you doing to rid this problem at Blackstock? This is damaging our ability to run the country. We're losing confidence and God knows what's going on inside that petulant prison. Have you contacted the military? Sir, <laughs> I'm not sure sending in the army will bring back public confidence. We cannot simply use troops to regain our prison. We will look like aggressors invading an innocent bunch of shoplifters. Innocent? Those tow rags are not innocent. Remember who the enemy was before Covid. If it isn't Covid destroying our economy, it's those reprobates sponging off the state and overusing legal aid fees. We need this sorted. We need it sorted now. Calm down, Prime Minister. Calm down. I have already put an ad on social media for new staff. Before we know it, we will recruit hundreds of school leavers to run the prison. We've done this before. Yes, but let's face it, we've never had an invisible killer ripping through our streets. This is, this is bonkers. I'm trying to run the country and restore faith in the British people. And all I'm hearing is the fear that Blackstock will soon be empty and our streets will have more problems. Oh, God, are you kidding? We are experiencing turbulent times. Our world is under threat. We are, however, acutely aware that many of you will be anxious with the changes occurring in HMB Blackstock. We would like to address the nation and inform them of some fundamental changes that are planned under this new management. We hope that our transparency will ease public anxiety and help us to build a trustworthy relationship with our community. What on earth is happening? Get this cretin off the air! If we haven't lost the public's confidence already, we have now. We're risking everything here. It's taken us years to feed the public the image that prisoners are scum and feeble-minded. This press conference goes totally against that. 
Our first and critical announcement is that the gates at HMP Blackstock will remain closed until COVID-19 is no longer in circulation. Protecting our residents' health is vital, but allowing them to continue with their rehabilitation is paramount to a successful reintegration. With their rehabilitation in mind, as of today, all residents who engage in purposeful activity will receive a national minimum wage. Slavery is abolished from this day onwards. I beg your pardon. I hope they don't think they'll be using the taxpayers' money to fund this. We already have 80% of the population being pampered on the furlough scheme. Never mind funding these animals. This announcement will no doubt come as a shock to many law-abiding citizens who are struggling, but... We can assure you that it is a sacrifice worth taking. Increased productivity will improve skills and experience, which, in turn, will reduce reoffending. You, my friends, will not have to worry about the residents returning to your communities. We hope that this conference has been useful for those with doubts on how Blackstock is being run. We have good intentions and will endeavour to reform our characters. I must, however, finish off on a word of caution. It has been noticed that a resident under our care has flouted the rules and escaped from Blackstock. He is heading for the County Durham area and he also has ties to the Barnard Castle area. Do not approach this individual. We will keep you informed. As you can see behind me, I'm standing outside HMP Blackstock. If the story unfolding in front of us wasn't quite crazy enough, we're going to see more inmates released today. Now I wonder who the lucky devil is going to be next. Wait, the gates. They're opening. And would you just look at that? Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Could I have a quick word with you before you go out and loot the streets and smash in some shop windows? Ah, I'm sorry. That was the wrong reel. What's happening here? Well, the managers have decided to take the term preparation for release by its literal meaning. So I've been assembling this from scratch in the motor mechanics workshop. We repair cars, get them road safe, and we keep them for release. Now that is a bit of kit. What, do you fancy your chances of the Nürburgring? Uh, we've also been hearing that you lot are getting the national minimum wage. Come on then, show us the dosh, flash the wonga. I've managed to save five grand. This will go on a deposit for a flat. Right, I'm going to shoot on now. I have a missus to return to. And one last question. Who can we expect out next? My guess is that all those detained unlawfully on the indeterminate public protection sentences and those on joint enterprise laws, the injustices are being dealt with first. Thank you so much. Now there you have it. You heard it here first. The calm before the storm. We're not moving an inch. Surely we're due a riot. And frankly, I'm excited. I've been Journalist John, live at HMP Blackstone. disaster story are we going to hear now? Either Covid's riddled the prison or they've killed one another. Whatever the outcome is, I'm still in favour of military intervention. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to HMP Blackstock's daily briefing. Before we address the changes we have made here, we would like to update you on the worrying story we left you with yesterday. As we highlighted, one of the residents sadly took off from Blackstock, but we are glad to announce that this individual has been located and returned to Blackstock. Following his 14 days isolation period, this individual will address his community. As a result of his 200 mile trip, we believe that this individual was acting reasonably and responsibly and that all residents would act in similar fashion if the opportunity arose. However, it has come to light that this individual enjoyed a second trip and this will not be tolerated. As repugnant as this story is, I am interested to find out the punishment. If that was one of mine, I, I, I would... I would... <laughs> I would like to finish by sharing a change in the regime here at Blackstock. We are delighted to announce the transformation of a residential unit into a university campus. 
The physical environment is under reconstruction. Non-Wi-Fi laptops are being installed and shared accommodation is on its way. Prison, by its very nature, holds residents with a wealth of talent and knowledge and we intend to take full advantage of this. Residents will learn academic subjects from their peers and they will be encouraged to cook for one another and have weekly assignments set. That concludes today's briefing. Today is a special day. Time has come when we can celebrate. We have a vaccine. I would like to thank my ministers for leading this campaign against such a dangerous enemy. I would like to extend my thanks to the scientific advisers for their guidance. But more importantly, I would like to thank you, the British people, for showing such resolve during difficult and uncertain times. This has been a national effort. Together we have prevented millions more fatalities. You should truly remain proud of yourselves. And when the next generation looks back in history, they will truly view their loved ones as heroes. Yes, I said it. Heroes. Thank you. Right, now let's address the elephant in the office. What on earth are we going to do about Blackstock? It is worth noting, Prime Minister, that those who have been released from Blackstock, well, not one of them have returned to prison, not one of them have reoffended, and they seem to be doing just fine. The authorities have been watching them closely. They must have done something. A burglary or a theft? What about their rent? Uh, are they up to date? You would think so, wouldn't you? Well, these lot are not only staying out, but they're on the ladder now, and they've got well-paid jobs. The rumour is we might be sharing our house with one of these ex-lags sooner than we think. John Pike, ex-Blackstock lag, is running for Blackpool North and the polls suggest he is favourite. And there's no backlash? It's quite the opposite, Prime Minister. The journalists have been distracted with Covid, so without their demonisation of criminals, public opinion has changed. And with the saga in Blackstock, people are proving quite forgiving towards those with convictions. I knew times were changing, but I never thought I'd witness a lover-con era. I've heard enough, Martin. Pass me the phone. John, I need a favour. Locate me the last twelve offenders released from Blackstock. Appoint each offender a governor's position in a southern prison. Just do it. I'll be in contact soon. Oh, and John, make sure we give them all a suit. Good old Boris. What would we do without him, eh? I've got another story for you. You've probably heard a thousand of these, but I managed to put mine on paper. I've just left the crack house. I feel great. I'm flying down the stairs and I've got the white in one hand and the brown in the other. As I leave the tower block, all I can think about is where I'm going to use. I've got loads of warrants out. I've lost count of how many times I've jumped bail. But I ain't thinking about that. It's on. As I step onto the pavement, two unmarked old bill cars pull up out of nowhere. I'm surrounded. I swallow the brown and I throw the white. By the time I get to the police station, I look like a car crash. I've got blood all down my face. They proper done me. I'm informed of what I already know. Possession of Class A, warrants and resisting arrest. I'm told I'm going to court in the morning. In the cell, I eye a cold cup of tea. Result, I neck the tea, stick two fingers down my throat, start retching and boom, parcel comes out, I'm saved. 12 hours later, when they collect me, I'm a black eyed, bloodied mess. They manage to get me to the dock.
The judge says, remand him in custody, but get that man some medical attention. Get him to hospital now. They put me on my own on a sweat box, cuffed and all. As I look at my reflection in the mirror, I think, what a waste. I start to cry and I look outside at all the people going about their daily routine and I cry harder. I yearn to be normal. At the hospital, the screw tells the lady, we need to get this man's face patched up. I'll tell her I need some Valium. She totally ignores me and tells us to wait over here. As we're waiting, I've got an idea, a bad idea. I need a shit. Gov, can I go to the toilet, please? The screw goes off, finds a toilet with no windows, comes back and he says it's all right, but I'm cuffed. They discuss, agree, and they take the cuffs off. They say, I've got five minutes. Result. In the toilet, I climb up on the sink, remove the polystyrene tiles from the ceiling, and I realise there's no way through other than to where the screws are waiting. I'm desperate now. The toilet's a mess and there's no way out. I'm pa They're banging on the door. I'm having a shit! Panicking, I grab the clinical waste bin, put it underneath the hole in the ceiling, I go behind the door and I pray like my life depends on it. Boom, the door comes through, the screws look at the clinical waste bin, look at the bloody hole in the ceiling, they fucking say the fucker's gone and they fly off after me. I can't believe it, I stay there and I'm praying. Oh, I'm so God, I'm praying. And then a nurse walks in. She sees me behind the door. She starts screaming, blue bloody murder. I bolt past her up corridors. I'm trying to find a way out, but there's dead ends everywhere. Finally, I see some double doors ahead of me leading outside, but my legs are starting to give way. I'm clacking like a turkey. Go on, gal, go on, gal, I tell myself. You can make it. As I reach outside, I'm on the grass verge and I can hear shouting behind me and I can hear sirens up ahead. It's over. I collapse in a fetal position and accept my fate. They throw me back on the van, take me back to the scrubs. I get six months for escape and three months for all the warrants. And no medical attention. My son is currently serving a nine-year sentence. My last contact with him was on Mother's Day 2020. That memory keeps me going through the pain and anxiety of not seeing him since then. It has been hard to fully understand how lockdown is impacting our loved ones. Our conversations are guarded we try to protect each other by not speaking about it. Those of us outside can take for granted that we can pick up the phone or jump on a Zoom call and talk to our loved ones, but with prisoners, it's not so easy. My son is in a Category D estate. He has worked hard to reach this stage and earn those small benefits that come with it. His own cell, home leave, opportunities to work outside and begin reintegration. But with lockdown, all of his dreams have been frozen in space and time. And mine too. He reads and watches the news to see how COVID-19 affects BAME communities. He is thankful we are able to provide funds so he can purchase extra cleaning equipment instead of food to protect himself from the virus. All we can do is be there for continuous support and unconditional love for them and also their children, their partners and other members of our families. But who is there for us? 
Mums. Who cares for me? My mum was difficult to deal with. My kids were nothing but trouble. When you have a baby, you're full of hope. The reality is, they grow up to find your syringes in the washing machine. While others use days of quarantine constructively, I use my working from home time to research the grunge bands of Seattle from the late 80s. Three days into this new obsession, I begin to feel a new hull, an ache on the inside. The whirl of guitars, that sound, that drone, the noise that only a heroin addict can hear. My eyes grow heavy with memory and my mouth opens, bending at the sides, and my head tilts back softly as I listen. But there is no wave beneath me, holding my body from falling into a waiting early grave. The guitars don't sound like the music wants it to. The fluffy tar clouds in heaven don't call to cushion me. I am falling, and there is nothing to soften the blow. I am sober, and I can't hear the sound. The world has its breaks on and my days are like my days of old. I have no responsibilities, no reason to get up. Oblivion costs £10 and lives on the streets of Boscombe Crescent. I dream of Lexington with poets past, Seattle with dead grunge gods, and Texas with the ghosts of outlaw folk musicians. I'm no longer excited by being free and detoxified. I take sleeping tablets, but the music doesn't sound the same. Quarantine holds no weight. I've been preparing for this for years, and hell has always been more appealing to me. People often ask me what heroin feels like. That, that is the whole point. point. It, it feels, feels like, like nothing. nothing. In the 18 months since I wrote my confession in lockdown, a lot has changed. I've heard that the nurses put the radio on when you give birth. My idea of hell would be sweating, pushing and screaming, waiting for my vinyl of joy with Ed Sheeran or Coldplay in the background. But how do you make a birthing playlist? Well, first of all you rule out genres. Not the obvious ones, but the ones you've been listening to your whole life. I no longer look at dead grunge idols for belonging. Their passing away saddens me. It doesn't inspire me to want oblivion or an early death. My mouth now bends into a smile as I tap my foot to a 10 minute jazz solo. I no longer want to strangle the busker who murders my favorite Radiohead song. Death can finally wait for me, patiently. Music no longer fills my baby shaped hole. Music will always be there, like a friend, like the one that never goes home when the party's over. But it's not my everything. No event of past traumas, PTSD, social workers, or being an addict in recovery will slow me down. I'm a mother, I'm a life giver, and I'm so glad I've met you, even if the radio was playing. Oh, there really is hope for us all. This is what James had to say. It surrounds you and I like fog. 
thick, engulfing, swallowing fog. The funny thing about fog, though, is that it fades away, breaks apart like curtains at the start of a performance. Even then, the show must end. The curtains close. The fog swallows us again, like a nefarious beast. Your candle blown out. But candles can be relit. Picture a middle-aged man on the beach with his pedigree pup. The dog shits everywhere at home on the beach, but the middle-aged man loves him. The waves crashing, the dog barking. I'm growing old gracefully. I realised I'm a natural writer and performer. So instead of getting unlocked for breakfast, I'm getting unlocked for you lot to perform. So here we are, people like you, people like me, people recovering and overcoming demons, a paper chain of people, all connected by the language of the heart. Stripped down to the bare bone, telling it like it is.